All right, people. It's Monday morning. We're back with another episode of Behind the Business of Fantasy Football. This is apparently a very long-awaited for uh, episode with with my man Peter Overzet over there. We have people excited in the background, people chirping on Twitter, which only means we're here to probably disappoint. Some of my favorite things to do out here. Um, I'm 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 personally excited for this one because I think I think Pete, as as someone who's a little bit newer to the industry in terms of like blowing up and getting past you know those first couple of hurdle hurdles of, of breaking out uh you'll be able to relate to a lot of people that watch these because i think the way fantasy right now is, is sort of set up there are a lot of people trying to to get past that initial you know that initial hurdle and you've kind of broken through that so i think today is going to be a a really really good conversation and just to kind of introduce you i figured i would take it straight from the horse's mouth straight from peter you are a fantasy football and dfs streamer a podcast host and comedian. You write the Daily Fantasy Life newsletter with Matthew Berry. I live stream lots of season long and best ball drafts on YouTube. And I'm friends, most importantly, with Miami Dolphins running back Patrick Laird because of a bit. So, Pete, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I was listening to your episode with Andy last week and I was like, this is pretty brutal having to go from someone who has at the top of mastering the fantasy football business to someone who literally just the other day finally uh, put up a membership program on my YouTube channel to make my first dollars ever from my own content. So yeah, it's a it's a bit of a drop off, but I'm excited to be here. Hey, man, everyone, everyone brings something unique to the table. And it's funny because I get uh, when I ha- when I bring guys on like Andy, unfortunately, I've, I've I've been able to bring on Andy a few times as well as the other footballers and just some of the bigger names in the industry. Whoever goes on next usually has the same sentiment. They're like, I don't know how I'm going to follow up those guys. But as I said, pre-show, you know, there there are four or five or six key topics that I think everybody brings a very unique mindset and kind of like bird's eye view to. So these shows end up going in very, very different directions, which is what makes them so useful to the people out in the industry because everyone kind of comes from a different background. So uh, I would kind of like to ask you as, as someone who put those up on, on the website, you got a lot going on right now. You know, what exactly do you describe yourself as, you know, are, are you, uh, say, you know, you're in the NBA top shot discord and, and a beautiful lady reaches out to you. She slides into your DMS. What are you telling her? Are you, a, are you a modern content Renaissance man? Are you an NBA top shot authority? Are you just uh, an endearing clown? What, what would you say of yourself? <laughs> Well, first of all, there's no women in the Top Shot Discord. Uh, and apparently there's no women on my YouTube channel either. I know this is a normal thing uh, and for both, us in here. Worry. But I pulled up my analytics the other day, and it was even worse than I thought. It was 99.7 <laughs> males, 0.03% females. I, that's yours, better than I yours? thought, too. You know, the, the 0.3 goes a long way. That's, <laughs> that's the actual loyal part of your audience. You just don't know it yet. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I actually, I, I, I made that website a few months ago because I was like, people were like, you have so many projects going on in different places. It was hard to track. So I was glad I got that up. And I was struggling with how to write that bio, I think just saying, I've always felt weird saying comedian. I've never necessarily like self-identified as that, but the more I think about it, I'm kind of like, yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. So I've become a little bit more comfortable with that. And I feel like it, because so many people are touts in this industry that it kind of makes it clear like, hey, you're you're not going to Peter to uh, get fantasy rankings. So yeah, I'm more comfortable with that. I like, I like host and streamer. I don't like saying content creator. I don't know that. T- how? Do you, where are you on that term? I can relate to you on such a strong level there. Like, <laughs> realistically, if I stepped out of my shoes, I do YouTube for like as, as a full time thing. But I would never in a million years introduce myself as a YouTuber or a content creator because you just sound so, so douchey. Like, it, because yeah, millennials exactly. just get such a bad rap with this stuff that I understand what it looks like to int yourself, uh, introduce yourself as a YouTuber. So I usually will say something like, oh, you know, do you do you play any fantasy football? And I'm like, I have a podcast or YouTube channel kind of based around that. Uh, me and my friends like film a bunch of content and, you know, I kind of go down that path, but I will never come out and just say something off the rip like that. But we're in the same path where I've, you know, recently kind of come into my own and been more comfortable, you know, putting that out there because I've been doing it for long enough now that it actually like is who I am. And I think I, like if I were to describe you from my angle, like I do see you as as a purebred like comedian entertainer in the space, in a space where, you know, there are probably two or three guys that are kind of up to the level that you're at. And it's probably weird from your point of view, just because like you're you're niching yourself into an industry where like comedy is not not a thing, right? It's not at the forefront. So when you when you say that, be like, oh, I'm a comedian. It's like, oh, like 
what kind of bits can you show me? Like, do you, if someone were to, you know, if you were to put yourself out there as a comedian, someone's like, what can you show me? Would you like have to show them your Twitter clips? Right. Well, it's funny you say that too, because uh, Levitan, uh, Adam Levitan has this line when he introduces himself to people, he always feels weird saying like I do, you know, fantasy football for a living. So he says, I'm into predictive analytics is what he tells people. And then I, I said, intro well, I introduced myself as, as uh, just in marketing for a long time, for, for a there long, you go. long time. Yeah. And so I was like, if I'm extending Adam's thing, I would have to say I'm in comedic predictive analytics. And so I, I just don't really <laughs> well, that know in itself that is fucking comedy. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, it, okay. it's it's tough. I, I I'm with you on that one. I think I, I used to normally say to people, I would just say, yeah, oh, I make fantasy football vids. You know, I make videos. <laughs> and it, wait, it you, like, you think that the vids is okay? Like you think that's a cooler version of it? I didn't. I didn't say vids. I believe I said videos. I caught myself uh, now retelling the story of uh, vids. No, I said fantasy football videos. Maybe I said vids. I hope I didn't say. Vids. I, I hope you didn't either for your sake. But <laughs> listen, like you're 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 a fantastic content creator, and I'm glad that a lot of your work is starting to get more like notoriety throughout the space because it's well deserved. You also, you know, w when you're not a full time content creator, what are you doing on the side? You have a full time job, right? This is not your full time thing. Yeah, no, it's not my full time thing. I, I do marketing for a software company. I've been there for a long time now, almost 10 years, I want to say maybe a little less than that. But yeah, I've been there forever. When you say when you say marketing, what uh, like what, what type of marketing are you doing? Yeah, I started out as a copywriter there. So I was doing all the press releases, web copy. Now Makes my sense. title is technically communications manager. And so we're, we're a relatively small company. So basically anything written, anything with marketing kind of goes through me at the company, helping our sales team with their materials, even the tech stuff with that. So yeah, not nothing glamorous, but it's a good company and uh, in good people. Let me ask you just kind of like a spinoff question about that, because you're uh, the content you create is, is so entertainment based when you're communicating as your company, are you allowed to like portray your personality when communicating with whether it's like customers or, or other companies? It's funny you say that they, they dev the, the people at my company know that I do a lot of this stuff, uh, on the side. And so they have kind of wanted to tap into that a little bit. It's hard to, because I don't know, I don't even do what I would consider like mainstream comedic stuff. So when they're like, do, do your stuff, Peter, like for, I'm like, do you really want me <laughs> To do that. Um, but I have gotten to do some fun projects that have kind of fit within the realm of stuff that they're doing and working on a few things like that now. So yeah, it is nice to kind of apply some of these skills that I've learned from doing this and actually take it back to the day job. That's yeah. Being a, you know, content creator, like in today's day and age is so useful for like every aspect of life. You'd be so surprised, you know, when your company will need someone to just like edit up a quick video for you or something. So I think that's, that's something that a lot of companies outside of this industry or outside of like content creation in general could use, you know, could use a lot more of, and it, it would be funny. Like I think companies would do a lot better if they focus on like the branding side of things and they use the personal brands of people to exemplify like why they're different than these other companies in, in the space, you know? Yeah. And I, I tell me if you're the same way, but like once you are in the process of making lots of, uh, dare I say, vids uh, or content, <laughs> you start to kind of approach everything through that lens. So when I'm thinking about this stuff creatively nonstop and then my job has an issue or, you know, something that they want to market or whatever, I'm now thinking through that same lens. And once you're in that mode, it's really easy to kind of spin up creative ideas where, where, you know, wherever they are. Oh, yeah. Once you go in, there's no coming back. And like even my friends will like ask me questions now. Just, you know, some of them are people that are like on the team and need help with software. Some of them are just like my friends in general. I'll like legitimately send them like videos now of like instructional videos like this is how you do this. I'll like overlay shit on, on, on the video. And I've, I've actually seen it like overtake a lot of parts of my life, which is funny. My buddy, Joe Holka, another guy doing the YouTube thing in the DFS space, he sent me a tutorial for how to make thumbnails. And it was like a very polished video. I was like, Joe, you could probably just post this on your channel and it'd probably do pretty well. Dude, yeah, I've sent, I've sent like how to make thumbnails. I've sent how to just like make a transparent background. I've sent like how to use Slack, like to everyone on my team, as soon as they join, I'm like, here's 16 videos that you need. And then I'm like, fuck, I just feel like a, a normal business now. You know how you like, you enter a job for the first time and they have all these like modules you got to go through. I'm like, yeah. I'm, no, I'm no better than the fucking man now. This is terrible. Yeah, the Nick BDGE LinkedIn training over here. We're all about big pharma. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> all right, so as I kind of mentioned, like I, I think you are a perfect example of people breaking through in a very unique way because you do sender your value prop on entertainment people have become kind of a lure to to the things that you put out one of them in particular has been these these twitter videos right like two minutes and 20 seconds uh 
you know, make a note of this afterwards. I got a guy at Twitter that will elongate your, your Twitter video uploads. If you ever want to go over 220, which I think would be big for you. We can, we can make that happen. But Twitter vids are something that I feel like has, has become part of your brand where you hit these, these two minute videos and they're like short, concise, they're funny. They're like perfect. They're so native to the, to the platform. And I think that's a reason why they do so well on the platform. I'm curious as to how long this type of content takes for you, because you know, I think a lot of people out there, you know, you hear hard work, hard work, hard work, work ethic and shit like that. And just gets like thrown into your brain at all times, but it's, it's just like so real. And I want people to understand just how long those things take. And I haven't asked you this. I have no idea, idea how long those take, but I would imagine, you know, from the ideation part of it to you hitting publish on Twitter, a two minute, 20 second video probably takes you anywhere from like two and a half to four hours. Yeah, you're you're pretty right on with that. And first of all, too, I'm conflicted about the two minute and 20 second thing because part of it, I like the constraint. You know, I like the Top Shot video that I put out the other day. I think I had maybe narrowed it down to like three and a half minutes of footage. And, you know, normally I'm like, oh, maybe I make a different cut for the YouTube or whatever. And then I'm like, eh, this joke's not that good. Uh, this part can go. Get it down to 220. And I'm like, okay, now it's super tight. And I do like what that, said, but yeah, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, it would be nice to, uh, to in some videos be able to post longer. So I'll definitely circle back with you on that. Yeah. The, the videos I was talking about this with, uh, Ben Gretchen, Pat Crane the other day, cause I'm reading this book flow about getting in flow states. And when I get excited about an idea and it's generally one that I'm going to make a, a Twitter video for, I go just like nonstop because it's like the idea has been percolating and I'm kind of saying some lines to myself in my head. And then I'm like, finally like, okay, I just have to get this out because I can't stop thinking about it. And I think that top shot one I made the other day, I went in just like a four hour blackout. I wrote down my ideas, crafted into the script, got my outfits and costumes, my different set pieces, recorded it, edited it, got the thumbnails ready, got it up on Twitter. And I think it was, yeah, three and a half to four hours, just like sprint start to finish. That's what I mean. Like that, that's, that's what I think t is so difficult for people to grasp in our space. It's like you putting that out, it could have flopped, but you decided to spend four hours of your day on a fucking two minute video. And I think in order to make it in this space, like you really have to have this belief that what you're doing is if it's very real to you and it's very natural to what you're doing and you think it's entertaining, you think it's funny, you think it's valuable in a sense, like you can't put a timetable on those things. It's just like four hours to make a two minute video sounds insane, but like the finished product looks, looks amazing. And no one would think that the amount of work you put into it would be the amount of work you put into it. But those are the things that like, I think separates you because not a lot of people are willing to do four hours of work for a two minute video. Yeah. And it's hard because I've been <clears throat> doing a ton of streams and a lot like of shows and it, start crying. Yeah. Okay? I, I was going to get, you know, I've been doing a lot of content <laughs> and um, just emotional for me, but it's, it's easy, right? We just hop on here. Like you made a show sheet, you put some work into that, but we just hop in and we shoot the shit and it doesn't require that much extra for us. I do a lot of those, but those don't get circulated as much. Those don't get shared as much. The diehards love, you know, hanging out with us, listening to us, but you're, you're not getting, you know, retweeted by all kinds of crazy people for an hour live hangout stream that you're doing. But then I was thinking to myself, okay, you know, those things take an hour for literally just three extra hours. I can get something that is going to have way more longevity, be way more evergreen, seen by way more people. But the trick is like, we're all so busy. Where do I find four hours uninterrupted because I don't know how you work, but I'm just not good at segmenting like, oh, I'll write the script this morning and then tomorrow I'll record it. Like once I get going, I'm like, I gotta be done with I'm this. The, I'm the same way. Like I have, there's creativity just hits me at different spurts. And like when it does, it's, it could be at 6 a.m. It could be at 6 p.m. It could be at midnight. I'm like, okay, like everybody leave me alone. <laughs> I think that was one of the reasons why I like, you know, not to be like anti the man, but why I needed to kind of get out of regular nine to five thing. Cause I, I really, I really am strongly against the notion of like people telling you when you can be creative and when you can be like at your best. And I'm, I, I so relate to that. There are some times where like, I won't work all day. And then all of a sudden at like 10 PM, I'm like, oh, that's such a good, good idea. And I'll work from like 10 PM to 3 AM just cause that's when crea creativity hits. So like that flow state is really fucking important because you can, you can hit like three hours of work in that flow state and it will be far, far better than like 10 hours of, of just shit work outside of that flow state. hundred percent.
it, and it's it's tough now too because I'm having that thing where now it's like a roadblock where I'm like, man, I don't I don't want to try to tackle this thing if I can't bang it all out at once because I know how important it is to hit that flow state and then the time just evaporates. So yeah, it's something I've been wrestling with because. It's also one of those things when I'm busy, I mean, I'm more productive when I know everything I have to do. It's just like stay focused. And then I'll have like a random afternoon where I'm like, yeah, there's nothing I technically have to do. And I'll waste away three hours on Discord or dicking around on Twitter. And so it's this weird thing where it's like, how can I be productive, but still give yourself the space to be creative? Because if I just said to myself every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, you're going to make a bit, it wouldn't work. I can't do that either. Do you, do you, do you find yourself recognizing like a pattern because i know i know my very rarely do i do things at night like you you were like oh i could do it you know yesterday during the afternoon or like later in the evening that was like immediately i was like nah that's off the table the earlier in the day we could do it the better because i i am my best like most creative self pretty much first thing in the morning have my first cup of coffee and i'm good to go other times it will hit me later but for the most part i found patterns in you know basically like what kind of sleep i had the night before different times during the day and like what i have going on that day i I try to, you know, if I need to do something super creative, I'm like, okay, this is going to be perfect for like this part of the day. And then I could box everything else out. Do you, do you find yourself having patterns like that? Yeah, I've started to establish some routines. Like in the morning, I read and meditate. And then I will also like, sometimes I notice when I'm meditating, I'm like, I'm thinking about this idea. And then the second I'm done meditating, I'll just start writing some stuff down in a journal. And those ideas will kind of it's either I stare at them and I'm like, I really need to do something with this now, or this is just chaff that I'll come back to later. But yeah, I think that's that's the key, right? It's like setting up some parameters or routines that give you space to be creative, but it doesn't feel like a chore or you have to do it or an obligation because then good stuff doesn't happen. Yeah, I, I think like going off of that, your your content resonates with a lot of people because it is like clearly you do what you want to do when it comes to content. Like you don't have some kind of routine. You don't have anything where you're like, oh, I promise the people that I have to do this. So I'm going to keep doing it, even though I don't enjoy it. like everything you do seems like you're enjoying doing it. So I do want to talk a little bit about the different types of content that you put out because it's it's very different. It's very it's really fun. It's engaging. Like one of one of my most enjoyable piece of content I did this summer was coming onto the randomizer wheel with you. That was like such a fun filming. And like the idea of the show is awesome. Even when I wasn't doing it, like I would jump into the live stream sometime and just like fuck around and you know you throw the the comments up on the screen and it's just like really fun to be a part of. I guess that that goes back to your comedy background. I, d I do kind of want to backtrack on that a little bit. Like, tell me a little bit more about your your comedy background. Did you do like stand up shows or, or are you just like always a naturally funny guy and you just did things that were revolved around comedy? No. Yeah. When I moved out to Boston, my wife is from here and I really didn't know anyone other than her and her friends. And I was like, I, I got to meet some people. And my brother and one of his friends had been doing stand up comedy. And I was like, I uh, I, I think I'm funny, but I, the stand-up grind just felt uh, so demoralizing to me. I went to a few stand, uh, open mics, and there's just people in the back, you know, writing in their notebooks. No one's laughing at each other's jokes. No one's talking to each other. And then I heard about an improv theater, and so I went and took classes there. And then I was like, okay, this is this is where my skill set matches with this thing. And so then I did improv for probably like six or seven years straight between classes and performing. Six or seven and years straight. Wow, it's a long time. Yeah, I had a stretch where I was like, basically now what I'm doing for shows where I'm doing like, you know, five or six streams a week, I was doing that for improv, just five or six nights a week uh, doing improv. And so it that was a really fun time for me, both to meet people. I, I met a lot of guys. The first thing I did in the fantasy space was the fantasy football comedy hour. Those were all guys I met doing improv. And then it just kind of gave me the confidence to write and be on camera and do things where I was like, yeah, I, I think I'm funny, but I didn't have the tools in the in the confidence to package those and and share those ideas and so that time improvising i think yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't be doing any of this if it weren't for improv so what do you think you can take away from improv in itself that transferred over to content creation not not so much like oh i got confidence from it but are there any like things that you maybe learned a year three years four years into it into improv that you were like uh that is that is something I never would have thought of at the beginning that you've been able to kind of like transfer over into into content because a lot of people I think in our space like not that they're not witty or can like improv but we could definitely use a lot more improvisation on, on the podcast around around the industry. <laughs> yeah, I've seen uh, I've seen some of the show sheets out there. They're they're a little rigid as far as how the how the flow of the conversation is going to go. But yeah, I would say a few things. You I mean you mentioned it earlier? Not being afraid to bomb. 
You know, when I did improv, I mean, I can't tell you how many shows I did where there would be very few laughs, just awful, awful improv that I would not wish upon anyone, but you have the show and you're just going out there and you're doing it and it's collaborative in nature. So you're not bombing alone. You're bombing with your, your friends or your teammates or so, castmates. So or not much different than your YouTube videos right now, basically. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it, but then I found by doing so many shows, I did get better, but I also found this like perverse satisfaction in bombing. Like I'm going to try to make you laugh. You are not having a good time. I'm going to try to win you over. And so just getting that confidence and being like, yeah, some of these videos I put out are going to flop. And early on, like a ton of videos I would put out, like I would be excited to get like three likes on a video, you know? And so just not being afraid because I, I'm sure you get this a lot too, where a lot of people will be like, Hey, how do you get started in this? Like, I'm just trying to get my editing set up good. Or like, I don't like how my camera looks. I'm like, just go, yeah. just start because like, you'll figure that stuff out on the way you'll improve it, but you need the reps, you need the confidence and you need the fearlessness to put something out there and have it bomb. Yeah, I get those kind of questions and emails all the time. And I think what I'm gonna do is create a folder that has just like my first video, my first blog post, my first <laughs> yeah. this. And anytime they do that, I'm not gonna answer them. I'm just gonna throw the image or the video into it and be like, this is where I started. That's so it's so important to learn the foundation of this shit because you can't you can't like someone wouldn't be able to sit in your chair or sit in my chair and do what we're doing. Because the only reason we have this knowledge is because we fuck so many things up like along the way. Starting is the only thing that can get you to this point. Like you have to take the steps along the way. You know, you try to skip it. It just doesn't work that way. So you have to kind of like cherish those moments. You said, you know, it, it's so exciting to get three likes on your videos. I think a lot of people find this stuff like extremely overwhelming, especially, you know, when you first start out the gate, like you'll realize that your first five likes are going to be just as much of a high as my next video that gets like 500 likes, right? It's all it's all relative to like where you are and you need to put into perspective where you are when you start. Like don't don't overwhelm yourself with looking at people who are uh, above you in the sense of like followers or any kind of numbers like that. Like you will hit these little hurdles along the way. They'll make you feel just, just as good. Right, and I think a lot of people too, they kind of romanticize the inversion and that's like what they're after of like, oh, if I just had this X amount of followers or this and it's like, no, because then you get here and there's just more plateaus, right? Like, that. you know, I, I could look at stuff you're doing. You could look at stuff Andy's doing. Andy could look at stuff Matthew Berry's doing. Matthew Berry could look at stuff Matthew McConaughey's doing. Like, it never <laughs> stops, right? No, like, it, it never you just stops. go. You have to it, enjoy it. Just goes up. Like, it's so cliche, but like, you really, really have to enjoy the journey. Like, I, I you know, I hate throwing stuff out there like that, but it's it just so, it's so real. There is no, whatever you think your end goal is, you need to flip the end goal to, the process of the middle, like enjoying the middle needs to be the end goal. And these other end goals along the way will be like the middle steps, ladders along the way, man. It's, it's, it's people are twisted. We need to flip this shit. Yeah. And it goes, I remember too, cause I I've been reading that book about the flow state stuff. And I was even remembering some of the early videos I made, like the first man's videos I made where I remember just it was my first time switching to, I think, Final Cut Pro for editing from iMovie. And it took me 10 hours to edit this <laughs> video, but I was in this flow state and just loving it because I, I had footage I was excited to work with. I'm learning all the new tools, Googling stuff, all that. And that same high I got there for a video that only got seen by a few hundred people is like the same high I was chasing the other day. Like that's the high you're chasing. And it's fun when more people are along for the ride. But like that fundamental energy and passion you have, like it better be there from day one because it's not going to be there three years down the road. Yeah. And, and that fundamental energy and passion that you have for the content you're creating is what's going to get the end goal that you think you're seeking. Like those those 10,000 subscribers are going to come because you have the energy and passion for it. It's not, you know, it's not the other way around. I think a lot of people kind of have that twisted. If you're starting with numbers in your mind, you're working backwards and you're looking backwards and you're, and you're going in the wrong direction. But let's talk about the wheel. The wheel is my favorite thing. To do. I <laughs> yeah. fucking love the wheel. Uh, what was What was the like idea behind that? How did you come up with that? And like, what, what are the logistics behind creating a piece of content like that? Yeah, I want to say, I, I feel really bad if someone had given me this idea on Twitter a couple years ago, because I did a couple of them back on the Roto Grinders channel when I first started there early on, but I didn't have the wheel then. It was random.org, which is just <laughs> so lame. Uh, it's doing the same thing, just not in a fun wheel like way. But yeah, I just immediately love this idea of drafting under constraints and in challenges. And initially when I did them, they were all pretty basic. Like you must draft uh, mascots with a bird name or whatever. And then as 
the series went on last summer, it starts getting to Nick has to tuck his shirt in 25 times in 30 seconds. And I was like, that's when the light bulb went off for me. Yep. I'm like, this is the show, man. Like no one gives a shit who we're drafting or why they just want us to put on an entertaining show and watch guys like us have to do absurd things while drafting. Yeah, so much fun. And and it really is so natural to you as someone who is in like the comedy world, that type of content is is perfect. And I think more people need to start integrating their their passions and their life and, and the things that make them happy into their content. Because we're in this industry where people feel such a rigid box that they need to keep themselves in. And it leads to that's why people get so burnt out by the end of the year, myself included. And I've gotten a lot better with it. But like, one of my biggest pieces of advice for people in the content world, like as soon as you start doing a piece of content that you don't enjoy, like get it off your plate. You don't owe anyone that piece of content. Yes, they might've liked it, but they'll like the next thing for the same reason that they began to like the thing that you were doing there. You can get burned out very quickly doing shit that you do not enjoy doing. For sure. I've been thinking about that a lot lately too. And like an example would be about how important like your personality and your enjoyment is. It's like the reason people aren't like quoting, you know, SNL weekend update jokes or, you know, going to see SNL weekend update shows is because those are like manufactured jokes written for like mass appeal. The reason you love a comedian like Todd Berry or John Mulaney is because their entire essence and personality shines through in everything you do. They're this fully formed 3D character and they're telling you what they think is funny and you find it funny because they think it's funny, not because they're writing the joke they think you're going to laugh at. And I see a lot of people do that with content like, oh, I should make this like this might be a thing that people want to see. And it's like, well, if that perfectly aligns with your own interests and passions, great. But if it doesn't, like everyone's going to see right through that inauthenticity. That's exactly, yeah. Like that's this series in, in essence. Like I started this series like three or four years ago and it was because I was so intrigued by like learning from people that have built businesses and built brands and just like the social world in, in, in general, I was, uh, I was so enamored by. And like, I, I come from a marketing background as well prior to like the content stuff and, you know, paid advertising, social advertising, things like that. And this is kind of a manifestation of that. And like, those are where my real passions lie. And I think just putting out content like this is what's going to get me to the next thing. Like when you're passionate about something, you create that creation it creates a road for you and it eventually leads to the next thing. You know, if I want to, if I want to pivot away from, you know, I, I might stop this series next off season if I don't feel like doing it anymore, but like people will still want to hear about it. But again, it goes back to like what, what you want to do. Don't be afraid to do it. Like, honestly, this is the first time I'm thinking about this. I think when I first, first wanted to start doing fantasy football content, I had the idea of doing something where like, oh, if I did like a 45 minute fantasy video, I was going to do like a workout in the middle of the video, you know, like talk about a player, do a set or like do three yeah. sets, of like bench press and then come back and like give some informational value about working out. And I still think that's like a good idea. I think someone can like have that kind of niche and like break out in that way too. But I don't, I, I think the biggest disservice is doing content that you really dislike. It'll burn you out super quickly and don't ever put like a creative barrier on, on your ideas when it comes to content. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think too, what you just mentioned, just the, the workout idea too, like it's completely fine to draw inspiration from other industries, other stuff out there. I mean, the mashing up ideas and bringing stuff to the fantasy football world where that stuff doesn't exist is I think one of the best ways, like don't get yourself overwhelmed with, I need to come up with this fully unique idea. No one's had no, what, what's another interest you have? Like you said, are you the workout guy? Uh, are you the chef? Are you doing a show where you're, you know, baking a lasagna? while talking about your fantasy thoughts, whatever that is, bring that to the table. And there's so much good. I draw so much inspiration from other comedians, different content I listen to. And I'm like, oh, that might be a good idea to bring into the fantasy space. Dude. So yeah, I'm, we're going to touch on that topic for like a, a long time in this conversation a little later <laughs> on. I, I have a, I have a book actually that I brought up from upstairs because I want to, I kind of want to brainstorm with you. I saw, I, have you ever heard of this book? Got to bring anything you can no. out of all you've got. So it's it's basically about pulling ideas from other industries that you're not. Oh, in. Okay. Sometimes we get so infatuated with like what we're doing and seeing other people in our industry and like how they monetize and stuff that you forget that there's you know a billion other industries that are making a billion dollars in their own right. And like we stop taking ideas from them and stop the creative aspect when it comes to to monetization. But I, I, I um, we're going to jump there in a second. I, I kind of want to keep going down some of the uh, content that you make, particularly like the email newsletter that you do with Matthew Berry. Um, I honestly, until I started doing like research for this show, I didn't know that you had been doing that with him. I think email newsletters are, are super cool, man. They're like one of those things that 
email email got like so uncool that now it has a bunch of swag to it i think especially from like a brand appeal you know doing like a weekly newsletter where uh that's something that we do we shoot it every monday morning where we talk a little bit about our brand like what happened in the previous week and some of the the dumbest shit we saw on twitter so what exactly is the newsletter that you do with matthew berry and like why do you do it in the first place is it actually just to like attach yourself to matthew berry because that would be like a very very sound reason like i wouldn't i wouldn't blame you for that yeah no i started talking to Matthew a little bit last off season and you know he had he had this mailing list for his fantasy life thing and he hadn't done anything with it and he was like I, I would love to turn this into some kind of daily you know NFL fantasy football newsletter and for him it is you know building up more of an engaged audience on there and then of course he can put ads into head to the fantasy life store in his different products and stuff roto pass where he has the various sites under there so that's what he was looking for and He's been a fan of some of my stuff and thought I would have kind of the right sensibilities uh, for pulling off that newsletter. And then from my perspective, I was like, I do a ton of writing for my day job. And so writing sometimes feels like the chore. And that's why when I've been doing content before that, I'm like, I want to make videos. I want to do podcasts. I want to do what I don't do during the day. But then I started being like, you know, I still do enjoy doing comedic writing and I don't do a ton of it. And I was like, yeah, let's give this a shot. And so it was kind of, getting more familiar with my own writing voice and it it took a little bit and ultimately I don't think my voice necessarily shines through a ton because I'm really going for brevity in it I feel like one thing of the fantasy space the fantasy writing space and we know there's tons of brilliant writers out there but people are verbose man and they go long and I'm gonna be honest I'm, with you you've been throwing out a bunch of high risk vocabulary <laughs> words out here I don't really know what they mean I, I don't know what I said. Uh, <laughs> Verbose so, and yeah. all these things. Yeah, it's all good. Keep going. Yeah, so I just kind of, basically I settled into a cadence where I would share some links, share some articles out that I thought were valuable, maybe a funny tweet, crack a few jokes, generally keeping it under 300 to 400 words, like pretty quick, and just get in, get out, give, basically my thought was, you know, when I do jokes on Twitter, like it's a niche, niche audience. Like I'm making meta jokes about stuff. When this is going to the Fantasy Life newsletter, these are the guys that play in an eight team home league or an eight team work league that aren't, you know, grinding Roto World, rest in peace, News Edge, blurbs. You know, these are people that are just kind of interacting with fantasy on the surface level. So I was like, what would be fun and informative for them to read? And then, yeah, just trying to make the best possible version of that. Yeah, the, the newsletter are interesting because we're seeing it take a, a little bit of a pivot almost to um I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with like Substack. Yeah. Yeah. So we've seen a couple guys monetize using Substack. And for those of you guys that are unfamiliar, it's pretty much like a subscription, um, subscription newsletter where, you know, you could sign up for five dollars a month or whatever, and that's you're paying for the newsletter. And it might sound a little bit ridiculous, but like we we're we're operating in a space that's so so highly dependent on like information and, and informational value to be a reason that you uh, subscribe to things and the reason that you purchase things. So Substack has, has been something I've kind of had my eye on, but I think emailing uh, the email newsletter that we do is is much more for just like having fun and relaxing and like, you know, kind of interacting with the audience and, shit. and the people that reply to that are usually like our, our, uh, our biggest fans. So I would suggest companies start thinking about email a little bit. I would also say if you're someone, maybe not like a personal creator or personal brand, but if you're starting to build out a little bit of a brand or like a company or something, don't overlook email lists. Like they're very, very powerful because they're one of the only assets that you can have in the social world where you actually own the information. Cause like, you know, if one of these platforms disappears, your audience is gone. Twitter goes down, YouTube goes down, you just get banned or some shit. Like you still have your, your entire email list. So I would use, I would, I would use creative ways to start building your email list. If you are a creator, if you do YouTube videos, you could say like, you know, I've, I've used this example before, but like you're giving out your top five running backs for 2021 or whatever. Like, Hey, you want the top 10 sign up for the email list down below and people will easily give that exchange for the value prop exchange. And one thing, and I, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Obviously, I think the Substack stuff works better if you have an established brand or established voice. Like my buddy Ben Gretsch, he did the Stealing Signal stuff initially. He's the first one. I, he's the first one I thought of, and I subscribed to it. I think for most yeah. of the, the football, so he did a great job with it. Yeah, and he took that over, and people know Ben as the Stealing Signals guy. It just yep. made perfect sense for that to become a Substack. I do think if you're just starting out on Substack, I mean 
I would keep, you know, 90%, maybe 100% of it all not behind the paywall, right? Like collect as many email addresses as you can, find your voice, do that. Because I see some of these guys and they want you to pay for it right out of the gate. And it's like, people don't even know what they're paying for yet. I, I don't know if that's the best way to grow behind the paywall. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I'm not actually too familiar with the platform itself. I didn't even realize that they offered... Um like a free version of it. I thought it was like strictly for, for paywall, but yeah, like I, I would never have just randomly signed up for his newsletter. Had I not been suggested it from like one of my friends was like, yo, he does a newsletter. It's like phenomenal. If you miss any of the games there, you know, cause it's like during the weekend, I'm like, yeah. I'm still, I'm still like going out during the football season and shit. So I don't get to catch all the games. I'm not like sitting there Monday rewatching all 16 games. So he does a, a full write up and someone told me about it. So yeah, I wouldn't have just dove in and pay for it. I, I, I think that kind of speaks to the bigger picture of not just email marketing, but most monetization in, in our industry today is just like, there's so much good free content out there that if you're coming off the rip, trying to get paid for it, like you're going to fail quickly. Most of the people that you see right now getting paid for this stuff are only getting paid because they weren't getting paid for so long. Like that's how you build up that loyal following. That's how you build up the respect from your audience to even want to value what you're giving them, whether it's a product or service or your time and attention or anything that you give them. I think that that can't be like overstated, just how much work needs to be put in to lay the groundwork before you can ask people for their money. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think it, it's hard too, because it is fun that this concept of like, oh, someone will pay me, you know, to do this article, to do this video or whatever. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, renting versus owning something like you're, when you're building up your own stuff and putting it out there, you're making all these little down payments in your, your future success. And it feels like I'm not getting anything, but you're going to be able to cash in on that down the road. And it's going to be infinitely more valuable than if you were just kind of exchanging it along the way. But you believe that, right though? Like you believe deep down that like this will all, this will pay itself off for you. Yeah. 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 And it, because like, I, I kind of have this fallback, right? Where like, if, if everything went to shit or whatever, the industry's cratered, I, I became a talentless hack. All of these things <laughs> I, I think are, 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 could be possible. I still had a shit ton of fun doing it. Right. Like the amount of people I've met and gotten to know, and not even from like a, a networking sense, but just like people I consider friends now people where if I were to get married now, as opposed to in, you know, 2013, like would be groomsmen at my wedding, like that level <laughs> yeah. of friendships that have come out of this. And so, yeah, I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. And that's why I've personally felt more comfortable having a longer time horizon on like making money on this to the best of my ability, because I was like, I know that's all going to work out down the road. And I don't, I don't want to say everyone should have that exact viewpoint, but that's just what has worked for me. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't think it's necessarily that like everyone should have that viewpoint. It's just like, you need, if you, if you don't like deep down really like believe in yourself and have that confidence, you're probably starting off the gate with the gate closed. Like you're not going to get through there. I think like, even when I started this five or six years ago, there was always this inherent belief. I was like, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but like, it's there. Like I believe in myself and I'll, I'm going to make this happen eventually. I think like confidence and belief in yourself is not, it's not like a, a switch that you can kind of flip on and off and say like, okay, I need to believe in myself more. It's like, if you really believe in yourself and you put your whole heart into this stuff and, and you put really good intention behind it, it will work out eventually. But there are obviously like just the nuances of life. You know, it's uh, the right company hasn't seen your content yet, but as soon as they do, they'll hop onto it and, you know, ask you for X, Y, Z. I think there's more and more people getting into it. So obviously it is harder to get noticed, but the people who are doing it right, like you, I think, I think, you know, there, there are a select few people that have like this, I don't know, like the X factor, you know, you could see once you kind of get onto their content, they're like, yeah, they're like, this is it. It's just a matter of time before it, it pops off or it breaks for them. And, uh, I, I, I truly think that like, this is the reason I have you on the show is I think that you're like one of the next few people, the very few people that will make this like a real thing for them. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm definitely excited about things. And another thing I think about a lot, and I, I'm curious how you've approached this is, I think I, I could have maybe accelerated faster. You know, say if I did just quit my day job and I was like, I'm going all in on this and I'm going to put out a video a day, like things that would be realistic if I had more free time. But I've always been worried about burning out, about things I love becoming a chore in work. And so I'm constantly kind of balancing like, yes, this is maybe quote unquote taking longer than if I would have pushed all in on it. But then I always go back to, man, I put such a premium on quality of life. Like I, 
I've really enjoyed, you know, I'm now 33. I've really enjoyed these like past 10 years. I don't have kids yet. I've met a lot of cool people. I've traveled. I'm not stressed. I squeeze in the other things that I want to do, working out, spending time with my wife and friends. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I can put a price on that. And the, all the other stuff can wait because it's like, how many times am I going to be this age, have this kind of mobility? And I just feel like I really want to take advantage of it. Nah, dude, like if you genuinely believe that, like if, you, if you're saying the last 10 years has been like phenomenal for you, there's no timetable for getting, again, going to that end goal. It, it's, it's about the process along the way. So I've definitely found myself, um, it's kind of what I did. Like I was working full time in marketing and I eventually got to the point where I was like, yeah, I can't, I can't continue. Like, I feel so strongly about what I'm doing and I know it'll be successful if I put more time and energy into it. And I would sit there at, in this office, right? This, this marketing office. And I would take my laptop and I would go into, I would go into like the kitchen area where people would like work by themselves. And for like eight hours a day, I'd just be working on my own shit. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not building anything for anybody else or something that I want to build for myself. And there, it was just no breathing there for me. I was like, there was no other, there's no other way to look at it for me. So I eventually left to put, you know, everything I had into, into this and it, it gives you more freedom and flexibility. But like, that was only because I, I couldn't like stand being at that job anymore because I, I knew what I wanted to do. If you're enjoying your life at, you know, as it is with your friends and, and, and your wife and like getting to do all the behind the scenes stuff that doesn't take a lot out of you. I mean, you're definitely going down the right path. I've, I've hit points for sure where I burn out. And I realized quickly it's because I'm doing some things that I don't enjoy doing. And then I, during the off season, I like regroup and I say like, I didn't like this. I didn't like this. Let me put a focus on my mental health. Let me put a focus on things that I really, really enjoy doing. And I'm going to cut the other shit out. Even if it's going to lead to less subscriber growth, it's going to lead to less money. It's going to lead to less revenue for the year. Like I'm, I'm perfectly fine doing that. Cause again, I think it goes back to it. It'll work itself out over the long run. Yeah. And I think the thing that's been difficult for me now is I am starting to reach a tipping point with the amount of things I'm doing and to be able to do it comfortably where I'm not stressed out when I'm not like, oh my God, I got to go wall to wall from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. just to get all this stuff done. And, you know, some of it has been because of really cool stuff. Like I started a Discord, you know, back in August, something I wasn't even to do myself, but this guy, Siler, reached out to me. He was like, hey, you should set this up for people. And then with the Top Shot stuff, it's just really exploded. And I have a blast hanging out in there with those guys. And it's a, a fun community building thing. But then on the other hand, too, I'm like, this is another thing. I'm now sinking a couple hours into a day, in addition to Twitter, in addition to doing my J job, in addition to working out, in addition to getting up my other videos and doing my other shows and making thumbnails and putting in tags and you know all that stuff that you know goes into it. And it's like, I am getting close to being maxed out on time. Yeah. I think you got to look at what it's like the 80 20 rule in a sense. You do need to have that top of the funnel thing that lets every let lets all those other like passion projects run, you know? Like you do these things that allow the wheels to turn for the other 80% of the stuff you do. And you could spend a lot of time on that stuff. I think a lot of early on content creators need to build themselves some sort of leverage, right? It's like it's great to be like, oh, we need to be on every single social platform. And <laughs> we try to be too, but like if I'm being honest, I spend almost all of my time and energy on YouTube, right? Because I've luckily been able to build leverage out there for myself where I keep putting energy into it. And I'm going to see ROI on that energy I put into it. I think that's what you need to always have this curious mindset of like, where do I find my leverage point? You know, and it's looking at these different platforms. You need to see wherever the eyeballs do not meet the supply of content creators. Once you can get into that, you, you'll find a leverage point there. Once you build up that leverage, then you could start spending the time and the energy on these other bottom of the funnel things. And I know it's very, very difficult for early on people to figure that out because you're just being told all the time, like put energy here, put energy here. You can get a pretty good feeling pretty quickly on what it is that builds that top of the funnel awareness best for you. And you should probably start to allocate your time and energy, I think a little bit more in that direction. Because once you do hit that leverage point, like the returns are exponential for all of the other bottom of the funnel things. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And it kind of reframes how I've been thinking about things too, because I had, I've had my YouTube channel for a while. Like when I first started doing my, my man's and LA character videos, I would throw them up on there. But I, then I had like a year or two where I didn't even use it at all. And then when quarantine hit, I started, you know, putting videos back up there, but I was not optimizing for anything on YouTube. I wasn't doing titles, right? I wasn't doing thumbnails. I wasn't literally nothing, right? I was just like, Hey, I'm pushing it to Periscope. Might as well throw it up on my YouTube as well. And then finally in October, 
in November talking with the line movement guys and, and they have some really sharp guys over there with the back end YouTube stuff. They were kind of pushing me in the right direction. They're like, hey, let's get you some lights. You know, let's get you a setup here. Let's actually uh, get you titling your videos right. And so I finally started caring. And to your point, I the returns just but from growth and community and all of that that I saw I was like, okay, this is what I now want to invest in. I still love Twitter. Twitter's a blast, but it's like I I feel like I I just do what I want on there. Whereas YouTube, 100%. I actually felt what I was putting in, I was actually getting out like what you just described. Exactly. Like I, I am well aware that like my entire, any dollar I bring in, any Twitter follower that I gain, any, you know, having X number of anything anywhere, all stems from me sitting down in some sort of flow state, researching for one long form YouTube video. Like everything in my life runs from that one fucking action. Like it, it's crazy, but once you can realize that, once you can figure out again what that leverage point is, everything tends to start running smoothly in the background. That's when you can start tweaking those other things, but like you really, really have to keep looking for those other things. And that's why like people blow up on, people go nuts about like the TikToks and the clubhouses. <laughs> it's because like there's not a lot of leverage points out there. So when one does become available, you at least have to take a look at it. Because listen, there are people that are going to be set for life, for life, just because they hopped on TikTok early. Like it's it's crazy to think about that, but it's very real and it's very practical, especially in like a, a niche industry. Yeah, it is true. I mean, the the first mover advantage on some of that stuff is is just absolutely massive. And and you know it. I mean, TikTok's still probably one of the few places where you're getting really good organic growth. I think YouTube does a, a pretty good job still. I mean, TikTok was like lighter fluid there <laughs> early on for people. But yeah, for some of these, man, like, you know, Instagram and even Twitter, like, I mean, I feel like I feel like I earned every one of my Twitter followers. Like it's slow going out there as You're far as really organic good at, growth. You're really good at the organic stuff on Twitter, which is you probably you are like, oh, there's good organic reach on Twitter. It there's not. You're just very no. good. You're just actually good at it. I think I think that's one of the things. Instagram's organic reach is like absolutely fucking dead right now. Yeah. Twitter Twitter's good for the niches, man. YouTube is obviously I mean they're run by Google, so they're the best search platform in the world. YouTube has so much organic reach still to it. Like you can start a fantasy football channel tomorrow and be up to a thousand subscribers in like two months if you do it right and you look in the right places and you work hard and like put your energy into it. So you always, always, always have to be looking at that uh, those those markets where Again, the 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 content supply is not meeting the number of eyeballs, and that's how you grow organically. I'm curious your thoughts about, uh, and when I say uh, YouTube strategy, I still don't have much of a strategy. I've been doing, I think, some things right, but part of, it's probably a blessing and a curse. I'm kind of bouncing all over the place. I literally cut up a video about decentralized finance. <laughs> day and then i people get you know their suggested videos is to go watch mans like do a penthouse tour like in <laughs> characters so they're like what the hell is going on with this channel so i i know i'm not optimizing from like a niche standpoint of being like we, i think someone on the show she, everyone's talking about nfts right now i saw this guy an nft youtuber that's doing exclusively about this non-fungible token digital art stuff and he's blowing up because everyone's like this is where i go to find this people they come to my channel and they're they're signing up for the Pete Overs that experience. They're not signing up for like I am going to become a domain expert in this one topic. And I'm curious your thoughts on that. It makes it sustainable for me, but I know it also caps my growth. No, you're good there. That's exactly what I what I would do. I've, I've been throwing around this idea of like the perfect content system, and I think it goes to you need to figure out some sort of niche that is extremely valuable from an information standpoint. You hit that really hard for, again, the top of the funnel stuff. And then the rest of it, I think, should be spent building your personality. Okay. So th those are like the two key functions I have. And I'm the same way with you. Like the videos you get on my channel will be like my favorite running backs for next year. And then the next video will be like a vlog of the New Year's Eve party that I just had in my apartment. And then the next video will be like a creative sit down that I just had with my two friends about what we're doing for the podcast for the next year. So while that's a slower growth overall in terms of like bringing on new followers and shit. I, th I, I truly think like that type of stuff is what sets the foundation for like elite down the road brands and companies and, and personal creators. I think that's what's eventually going to skyrocket you up. Like when you do pop, it's going to be to a level that that surpasses the ones who weren't doing that stuff, even if they're ahead of you now. Yeah. It, I mean, that that's kind of what I'm hoping for. And it, it does go, I mean, 
it sounds like it can be like smart and calculated, but honestly, the reason I'm doing it is just similar to you. Like you go make the vlog. It's because it's fun for you recording the business behind the scenes conversation. That's fun for you. And again, it goes back to that thing. Your passion shines through. If I, if you were just grinding running back sleeper videos every single day, like the, the, the will to live in your face would be sucked out. Like people would be able to tell. Dude. Yeah. I, I see a lot of people in our industry, like doing it, like probably YouTube channels that were around the same size as me a couple of years ago that now have like double or triple the growth that I have. And I'm, I'm like perfectly fine with it because you're at a place legitimately like asking that question were questions that I was asking myself probably like two or three years ago. And I'm like, I feel like this is right, right? It just felt right to me that I continued doing it the way that I have done it. And it's, you know, looking hindsight, I'm like glad I did it that way, obviously, because it's worked out. But I see these other channels that have double or triple the growth that I have they're putting out content that I would have that same growth, but I don't enjoy doing that shit at all. So I do really think like intent doing what you like. And, and basically the theme of this conversation is, is like very, very, uh, wildly important. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think it does get a little fun too, because I'm sure you said you, like with your YouTube, um, you know, knowledge base, I'm sure there's things that pop up where you're like, man, if I wanted to spin up a channel about this topic, become an expert, be the first mover in here, like I could do that. I know the roadmap, I know the playbook, but then you're also like, it's a shit ton of work. I don't think I would enjoy it. And it would probably feel like work along the way. I've thought about just spinning up a complete, like, like marketing YouTube channel in its own right. And that's what comes back to me. Cause I'm like, it's almost like I'm, I'm, not where I started, but like I'm putting in the work on fantasy, even though my passions lie, not that I, I don't like what I'm doing, obviously, but my passions lie in another place. And I'm almost like I need to sacrifice this little bit so that I can actually do that later on down the line. You know, it's always kind of like a, a, a give and take. Like I can do that, but I don't think I have the energy to like, I still, I'm still looking for a leverage point in order for me to be able to spin off completely and be like, oh, now I'm self-sufficient making content on like on this topic or something, you know? Yeah. And you are, uh, one thing I've heard you talk about on a couple of your recent shows is just this idea of trying to consolidate a lot of your stuff and your offerings into one place. And I, I'm not necessarily selling anything per se, but I felt that just from like a content perspective, like I have stuff on my YouTube channel, you know, some of it has its own iTunes feed. I do the ship chasing over here. I do splash play over here. I do swole cast. And it's like, I do, I, I have a blast with all of those things. It's why I do them, but I do feel like scattered in that maybe I'm spreading myself thin, not from an enjoyment perspective, but from like a growth perspective, just because I'm in so many different places. I mean, do you see something that you think works best for you in terms of like whatever it is that you're feeling a little bit like uneasy about in what you just said? Like what's, you know, you're spreading yourself too thin in terms of like maybe capping your growth. There's probably something there that maybe you think would be better spent uh, your time and energy on. Like, is there something kind of in, inside that you think? I think it just goes back to that thing of each like enterprise or thing. Like I know how much work goes into the YouTube for doing it right for on the back end. And like, even after a video gets posted, like going in and setting the ads at the right stuff, like, you yeah. know how much all of that adds up. And so then I'm looking across like essentially like four different YouTube channels, including my own of all the things I could be doing to get the most out of it. And I literally don't have enough time to give every single one of those vehicles the, the attention that it would need to like really succeed, uh, in a way where you're pouring gasoline on the fire. So you're putting all those pieces, all those like podcasts in itself, we'll call them like small businesses in itself on different YouTube channels. Like you, you how come you don't put them all on your, your own by itself? Well, I'm kind of actually starting to work on that. Like I do this podcast lulls with uh, Brian Hooper, who's one of the top DFS players. And we were doing it on his channel and we're, we're in the process of bringing it over to mine. I do splash play with Chris bags. And I think that's on its own YouTube. I think we might bring it over to mine. So I'm kind of in the process of consolidating. I think ship chasing though, that I do with Pat and Gretch, that is going to stay like very, you know, kind of fantasy football focused. I mean, that's going to be the, the dynasty, the best ball, the high stakes season long stuff. And so I think that makes sense. But yeah, to your point, I am trying to consolidate a little bit. What about these, with these other dudes that you do these with, do they not like help you out on the back end? No, I mean, honestly, like, so what my stuff, I've done podcasting with Pat forever and we have like a good thing going where he handles all of the audio stuff. He's really good with the, with the audio mastering and he enjoys doing that. And then I handle the video stuff. And just because I've gotten so familiar with YouTube now, I'm kind of just the default person to do it. I guess I could 
I think you uh, should. I think you should go back to the beginning of this conversation where we said we make video instructionals for people. <laughs> Everybody I've brought onto my team, my friend who is the most illiterate tech person in the world, I make him do some of the work for the shows that we do together. It's, it's a simple, you know, it, it's really not that difficult to upload like a fucking YouTube video. And now, you know, y you eventually teach them how to make thumbnails, how to do these things. And it probably feels a little bit weird because you're like, I've been doing it for so long. But you'd be surprised at what people can do once you give them a little bit of, uh, of leverage. Yeah. And I just want to be clear too. It's not like everybody, everybody who I do stuff with is, is pulling their weight. Like I, the stuff mm -hmm. I do with Spags on Splash, like he handles all of it on the YouTube side and Pat, like in season, he was doing his own version basically of stealing signals, a video version of it called stat chasing, where he was doing a two and a half hour deep dive video. So wow. everyone is bringing value in their own way, but it was just this, it, it does feel like a lot when you have an like you said, though, you now have these sub things underneath your umbrella right. and you kind of have the playbook that you can give to people of like, this is what's worked for me. Now do this over here. Yeah. So that's what we've, yeah, that's what we did basically. Like we built everything under my YouTube channel. And then eventually when I got to the point where I'm like, these things can kind of take off and grab legs of their own, let's split off and you guys can kind of take over fully, whether it's dynasty or whether it's more like entertainment, pop culture shit. I don't think I'd recommend doing that from the jump because then you don't yeah. get to see again, you don't get to see which of those things like grab their leverage point because you need to put all your energy into the thing that does uh, hit for you. And then from there, again, the ROI on the bottom stuff tends to to taper up really quickly. So once I hit that leverage on my YouTube, I'm like, OK, I can kind of spin off and do whatever the fuck I want and like have my friends post it up here and they'll have such a good starting foundation, whether it's like a thousand, two thousand subscribers and that that beginning part is like jumping ahead two or three years on other content creators. And I will say the the one positive of that kind of setup, and we've experienced this with ship chasing and stuff, is like the community is so strong and the mm -hmm. people who are there, they love it. They tune in live every week. And I noticed the flip side of that with like this whole Top Shot stuff where I had my Discord throughout the NFL season. It was kind of like the diehards, a lot of us who think similarly, you know, like-minded people. And then I had this huge influx of Top Shot people who don't know me from Adam, just coming in or whatever, joining it. And it, it lost a little bit of that vibe. Because everyone's looking around like, this guy's saying shit none of us would say. And, and it yeah. made me realize that as much as we all want to grow too, like growing at rates where the community can stay intact, that's now something that I, I think about a lot. Extremely important. Something that I've wrestled with too, like as we try to scale, I'm always like, I don't want to, I don't want to lose like the family aspect of the brand that we have, whether it's like just the cohesiveness of me and my friends, like, you know, yelling at each other on Twitter or like just the fact that we tweet back at everybody that tweets at us and just shit like that is something I think is so important. It's why it's okay to take so long on like this part of the journey because you need to build that shit up if you want to have longevity in the game. And like when we started our discord too, when we first ripped it off, we were like, okay, we're going to keep it open for like X you know, number of weeks so that we can build up a good community of people so that it never hits like a dead spot in there. And people are always talking all the time. But as soon as we felt comfortable where that would be the case, we we're like, we're closing this off. And like only people who are Patreon members get access to our discord now, because those will obviously be like true fans and anything that new people bring into it, like they're going to bring into it with passion. They're going to bring into it with energy and they, they, they want to be there. Like they paid to be there. So I think, yeah, there's a, there's a real importance behind making sure you don't try to scale up too quickly and lose like what you have there. Right. And it's when you scale up at a, a gradual rate, like that community becomes the overwhelming majority of the people in the discord. And those people are shaped, you know, by their tone and sensibilities mm -hmm. and the kind of jokes we making by what we set the tone as from the start. And then when you have the new influx come on, like those people fall in line too. They're like, Oh, this yeah. <laughs> is, this is how we talk in here. You know, we're not being misogynistic. This isn't a frat house. You know, we're being smart. We're being funny. We're sharing information. And it has been cool to see that work where when you do have like the pillars of your community and they're setting the tone and then seeing this whole amorphous blob kind of move in that direction as opposed to what I would call a toxic one, <laughs> it's it's really rewarding. And I've had some of my funnest nights literally in the past month or so have been hanging out in Discord with everyone, all tagging the same jokes, doing bits, I'm sure just you're, having you're, a uh, your, your wife is very happy to, <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> yeah, she's been a saint lately, especially with all... Because I did do a pretty good job like in season of only having like one night a week where I did shows. And now with this Top Shot stuff, we've been kind of just like firing them up 
willy nilly, like random nights. And so we've, we've lost some, some couples night time and uh, <laughs> yeah. she's been very patient with it. Oh, that's good to have someone supportive like that. that. That's a great point. Like when the community starts slowly moving together, like you can't make, you, you know, you can't make rapid changes. You can't build something up quick and then expect everyone to, to slide with you if you didn't build it up. <laughs> You, you know, you didn't build it up the round way. And that that's why I think it's uh, important because like 10 of those like diehards are, are worth more, not in like a monetary standpoint, but like worth more to your brand than like a, a someone who's got a thousand randos in their discord, man, because those people aren't going to fight for you. And they're not going to be the ones that, you know, push ahead for you and, and buy your products and like support you when shit's going down. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's a that's a fantastic point. Now, I, I saw the I saw the stream that you, Joe and, uh, and Al did together and uh, about like you know wanting to be a content creator and it was on al's twitch channel twitch what, what, are they, what do you call it a twitch channel twitch i always just hear people say twitch stream i know nothing about twitch i'm such a donkey about twitch me i, I have no idea what's going on on twitch though i do feel like if they if they uh as, as joe was saying the discoverability over there if that was fixed a little bit i think that's another platform that people could really kind of like pop off uh pop off on but I, you guys talked a lot about monetization and i know you are not someone who, you know, you, you talked about already, like you're not seeing returns on this stuff, but you're also not putting energy into doing that. So like wh what, I guess like what, uh, what's your like overarching take on this? Is this something that you're just like, I, I believe in what I'm doing so strongly that it's going to work itself out over the long run? Or are you just, are you battling with yourself on, you know, do I start plugging things? Where do I even start if I wanted to do it? Like things like that. Cause I, I think this would be a good brainstorm session. Cause I got some ideas for you. Yeah, no, I, I, I do uh, really want to get your ideas. And basically all everything you said, I was just like, uh, D, all of the above, <laughs> like, which can be hard where I'm like, I have told myself, it'll just work out down the road. I have a day job. I don't, I'm not doing the starving artist thing where like I'm having to scrape to put together things. So I don't, I don't have the hustle in me from that standpoint. And then also I am conflicted of this, this whole idea of, I've, I've always felt weird about self-promotion in the same way of just feeling hesitant, calling myself a comedian. I felt weird asking for money, especially when most of what goes on in this industry for asking for money is like providing, you know, concrete information in the form of ranks or DFS projections or whatever. And so I'm like, where do I fit into that? Because I do provide something. I provide entertainment and I provide comedy, but I don't, there's not really many has to monetize it in a way that doesn't make me feel gross let me let me ask you like do you, would you uh if, if a company were to hire you to be a full-time content creator is that something you'd want to do or is it like you'd only want to do this in your own right because like I, I would have no interest if you know some i don't know like yahoo came to me and they're like we want you to be a full-time fantasy content creator or whatever i'd be like no like i have no interest in that whatsoever i like building my own thing and like that's what i'm passionate about would you be open to that just curious I don't think so. It would have to be like the most sweetheart deal of all. And I don't mean from a money perspective. I mean, like my dream, if someone offered me a job, like say if ESPN was like, you know, we want to fly you around to all these sporting events, have you do man on the street interviews, sketches, and we're going to, we're going to have a camera crew, a team and everyone, and we'll get you a team of writers and you just go do your thing at all these sporting events and make comedic content. I'd probably take that job. I think but that like, job doesn't really exist right now. So it doesn't exist now. And, and I, I think like almost the point I was getting to is you're, you're almost, you're like, if like Michael Vick came around in like 1975, where like the GMs <laughs> and the owners of these teams are like, no, he can't be good in the NFL because we haven't seen his type succeed, right? We need a six, three fucking pocket passer. <laughs> I think you're a little bit ahead of your time in our industry right now, but I think a lot of brands and, and companies don't really understand that. Like the, the needle gets moved via content. And the best content comes from the best content like creators and you fit into that mold. But I, I think what you need to do, like, I, I think like a, I'm surprised, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm surprised right now, but like, I think Barstool would be a company that, that would reach out to you, to be honest. I have no idea if you have like any interest in companies like that, but I think some sort of like entertainment company rather than like a sports first company could reach out to you to do more like sports niche type of content. So I was curious, cause I think you will get some sort of offer like that from a media company to make content because you know, you're a content creator. That's like what you do. And there are some people that monetize in this industry by selling products and selling services and things like that. And if that's not what you want to do, like you do have to look different avenues, but like what you do best is you're creative as shit, right? Like you do things that other people don't do. So I think you need to put some of that creative energy into the monetization. You need to be creative. Like you can't look at what other people around the industry are doing to monetize 
and think that that's going to work for you. But like, you're very good at thinking of things that other people can't do. Like you could do that monetarily as well. And that's why I was bringing up this book before, because he looks at other industries and he's like, why can't people do X, Y, Z in this industry? And you think about it and you're like, oh, I could. So what I would do for you is like, look at, look at entertainment brands and companies, see how they monetize, see how they do it. Ones that you admire, ones you think do it well and start to chip away from that. Like, don't look at anybody in the fantasy industry if you don't think what you do is like anybody in the fantasy industry. I think like, honestly, you could like put out on uh, on Twitter, like after this call, you can be like, dude, I'm doing a, a 30 minute stand up set next week. 10 of you guys can come in. I'm going to sell tickets for $50. That would probably sell out in 10 minutes. And you just made like 600 bucks on that. And you can make it like an interactive comedy skit in a sense, which in reality is almost just like a, an AMA, which people do in fantasy, right? But you kind of like tweak the way you said it and people are willing to pay for it. So I think you need to start thinking of shit like, like comedy is part of your brand. Like, why not do some shit like that within your audience? It's, it's different. You know, you're not going to be in a physical location, but like start to think of different creative ideas like that, I think, to monetize if you wanted to. You probably feel a lot more comfortable doing something like that because you actually feel like, oh, I'm giving I'm giving value. I'm sorry. I just rolled yeah. on for like 48 minutes. But no, I thoughts. mean, you got you got my wheels turning. Well, what early it was like early in quarantine, I went I had mentioned Todd Berry earlier. He's one of my favorite comedians. And one of the things he does, he has, you know, probably three, four hours of stand-up material, but he's also known for doing these crowd work tours. And he's like a magician with these crowd work things. And if people aren't familiar, it's just you kind of interview someone in the audience and you start riffing and you're basically building a stand-up set on the fly just based on what these people tell you. And he kills at it. And he did one online when quarantine hit because you know he makes a lot of his money from touring he wasn't able to do it so he did the todd berry virtual crowd work tour and it was a little bit of a tech mess but it was very very funny and i was just thinking of like what if i did like a pete overs at fantasy crowd work thing where i interview you about your team the like dumb stuff you the drops you did and i just roast you for all the all the dumb stuff you did or whoever you lost to and i'm like that could be a fun thing yeah, like that. Those are the type of monetary things I think you need to be thinking about, because I think one of the bigger mistakes that that people make when they're trying to monetize is not being able to align what they're selling with what their actual value to their audience is. Right. And once you kind of get that unlock, if you're like, I'm really good at this and this is why people follow me, you can kind of reverse engineer what you're giving off to them. So I think something like that would would work really, really well for you. I just think you need to be kind of in that zone a little bit. One thing that I find myself running into is I, and I know that merch isn't a cash cow or, or maybe you could, you could tell me differently, but I do think one thing that I would have a lot of fun doing and feel like I would provide someone is coming up with merch, but not just the, like, here's the logo. I'm going to slap it on a bunch of different stuff, but like merch that directly ties in to bits and stuff that have happened on my shows. And I have lots of ideas for it, but I haven't got the infrastructure set up. And I know that the way I want to do it as like boutique stuff, and I know you have thoughts on this, it it feels expensive. It feels like it could be a little cumbersome. And I, I just haven't got around to it because it, again, it feels like this big chore to set up. No, I think that's perfect. I think a lot of companies that are made through like entertainment, like going back to Barstool, like half of their revenue comes from sponsorships. The other half comes from merchandise. I think merch does not work well in our industry because merch is like a, an entertaining kind of thing, right? Like you want to be a part of the community a little bit and you want to be, you want to get something that's like funny and something that you're exclusive to. Most people aren't entertaining in our industry. Therefore, like their merch doesn't really sell. Merch is, it's becoming more and more popular within my brand, but it's not anything I put focus on. I do think for you, it would be a really fucking good idea to do that. And there are a couple, there are a couple different ways you could do it. Like you can do it where you actually find a manufacturer you would have to do some, you literally just like go on Google or YouTube and be like manufacturers for t-shirts in, in the U S or wherever you wanted to get it from. You would go back and forth with like pricing and sample and, and quantity. Uh, most of those have like a minimum order quantity that you have to buy. So it might not be the best for you. The profit margin on those is a lot higher because you also have to like manually ship them out and stuff, but the quality is good. You get to test them out and see like what you want to get rid of and stuff. You could also do what, what's called drop shipping. Basically, there's a manufacturer, there's a warehouse somewhere. It's like in fucking California or something. And they have like yeah. a million t-shirts and hoodies and whatever. And you go onto their website, you make an account and you slap your logo onto a sweatshirt and they take care of everything else. They take care of shipping it to the customer. They take care of designing it and stuff. 
most of the time it's not as high of quality and you don't get to like see them before they go out unless you order samples like physically you know pay for the full price you lose a lot of profit as well I think, I mean, I think for you, maybe a mix of both and kind of testing out what you want to do, because this is something I did too. Like this, the only reason I know about this is because I did a mix when I first started off holding inventory. You also have to make sure that you have room in your house if you're actually going to like house yeah. that stuff. Most people, you know, if you're not selling a billion fucking t-shirts or something, you'll have plenty of room in your house to actually keep it there. But it gets a little difficult because you get a t-shirt design. You're like, oh, maybe I want to put this on hoodie. And then if you have like three or four colors you want to do, and then you want to have small, medium, large, extra large, 2XL or whatever, that can get crazy. So for a lot of like a lot of YouTubers that have like millions of followers, a lot of the money they make is from merchandise. So they'll have like warehouses or literally like rooms in their actual house. So they're fucking mansions at this point with just clothes and just merch. And they'll have their friends like shipping it up and packing it out. So I'd say like drop shipping is probably best case scenario for people in our space right now. People that don't have the time or aren't going to focus a lot of energy on merch. But I think like you're definitely thinking the right uh, right path. Merch entertainment to to the same. Yeah. And that's the thing I'm trying to get it to like really match up and blend with the stuff as opposed to necessarily just slapping the same logo on a bunch of stuff. Like my wife, I'm curious your idea. My wife had this idea for the randomizer thing and she's like, you should sell like 500 randomizer boxes before the randomizer draft start. And you put like the randomizer beer mug, the randomizer shot glass, maybe you throw a beach ball in there because it has the wheel colors or whatever. And it's just like, this is the box that gets you ready for the randomizer drafts this summer, you know, like something like that. Dude, if you sold like 500 boxes each week or something or wh whatever the idea was, you know, like I would just throw, and you put them at like 50 cents or something, I would just buy like 15 each episode, like for no reason. I'm just like, I don't, I might not even watch it, but I like want to win something, you know, like I think that would work yeah. really, really fucking well. So that's, that's, I think that's a phenomenal idea. I think building around these pieces of content that people really, really love is and it's specific to that stuff because that's again how you build like the community is people feel like they're a part of the randomizer they feel like they're a part of whatever it is you got going on you build that way like you build from the foundation up not not hoping that something here works and then like hits the people down there i think you go you know top up top down yeah. bottom up whatever the fuck i was saying yeah you know I mean. <laughs> so that now i just have to like i just need to get my shit together and i think you know i i appreciate so you to, what you're you need saying. to put you need to put you need to make sure that like you're intentional about it. Like put put energy yeah. and focus that you would put into content into what to what you're gonna do monetarily. Yeah. No, you're hundred percent right. And I think it's been hard because if I if I have that what let's call it like mental energy, I'm normally like, all right, let's just make a video. Let's do something that's gonna be fun. But for this to be sustainable and for me to continue to grow, I need to put equal amounts of that mental energy into some of these other things. You also realize like once you do that, you sacrifice the content. You're like, oh, I would enjoy doing this. Once you start getting on on these different ideas with the randomizer and like and and different products and value, as long as you feel like you're comfortable, you're like, oh, I'm giving value. This is going to be fun for the audience. You're going to have fun creating this shit too. As soon as you start selling shit that you don't believe in, that's when it's like feels like a chore and you're like this, you know, this feels spammy and this feels gross and uh, and all that other shit. But if as long as it's something that you like actually believe in, you're going to have just as, as much fun organizing that as you will creating the content, I bet. Yeah. And I, I think about it from myself of as like a consumer and the podcasts or the creators that I like and how I support them. And like, I get excited to buy a cool t-shirt. You know, I have one of my favorite music blogs called Gorilla vs. Bear. He does incredible merch and he came out with these basketball jersey, like mesh jerseys with this thing. And I bought like two of them. One, because yeah. I think it's cool and I just want it. And also I want to support him because 95% of the music I like, I've discovered on his blog over the past 10 years. And so I think sometimes I have to get myself out of that of like, people do want to support you, especially if they're getting something cool back. And that's why I'm just like, I don't want to just slap something on a Teespring cotton shirt. Like I want people to feel like, no, this is cool. And I'm supporting him. Yeah, no, that that's the right way to look at it is, is really as soon as you, if you can flip your mindset to like, you're not spamming people. You're like actually believing that you're giving them value. You you believe that you're giving them something cool. Then pitching them doesn't feel like pitching them. It feels like, yo, like this is something really cool. I'm proud of like we're in this shit together. So if you want to support me, you could do it. And the other thing with that too is like, if you believe in the product, if you do some kind of premium shit, we're like, you know, I'm going to roll out 25 sweatshirts for the first drop. You can price them pretty high too. If they're like high quality and you could price these different things that you do on a more personal level, that's more like attention by you at a higher price when you when you start like not giving a shit about what you're putting out there monetarily that's when things get tricky and you're just like oh you know i hope enough people buy them but like once you believe in some shit people really will buy it 
for sure. Yeah, and I think that that idea too probably helps you if you're like, hey, I am just going to have 100 sweatshirts made. That's really easy then from handling your own inventory standpoint because you you know exactly what and people know the rules. Hey, when it's sold out, it's sold out. It goes into the vault or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It gives it a little bit of like intention behind it too because you know if you miss out on the first drop, then there's a little bit of anticipation for the next drop. If you do, you know, you get creative with how you want to do these yeah. things. But I think that's really what you need to do is like, the same way that you approach content and the way that you approach most things in life, you need to approach this as well. Let's talk about what everybody really came here to talk about. Uh-oh. NBA Top Shot. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna I don't wanna kill you. I know you're not like uh, you know, you're not as crazy about it as people probably make it out to believe, and it's kind of become a bit at this point. I'm more so curious, you know, I'm not gonna be like, What well, yeah, what are your favorite fucking players on there? Yeah, yeah. We're in a crazy time right now when it comes to like investments and i think a lot of it kind of spawned up and just in 2021 just over the last like couple months um with the gamestop thing and all that stuff and people it seems to me are looking at whatever can make them the next quick dollar and it's nba top shot has resonated so much with our community because it actually feels like you guys who are at like the the forefront of it have moved the needle on that fucking platform because every time you see them tweet some shit out like Oh, uh, someone bought a fifty thousand dollar card. It's like one of you fuckers. You know what I mean? And I'm just, <laughs> Not me, but yeah. I you know, know what, what I mean, mean, though. It's like it's, it's I like know what you Jonathan mean. Bales or uh, or your yeah. friend Jack and <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, exactly. Like one of those guys. I think Jeremy's actually going to be on for for this episode next week, which I'm oh awesome. Uh, I'm super excited about. Yeah, but it seems like you guys are actually moving the needle. So it's been really fun to watch. But it also feels like when it comes to like NFTs, those things will work over the long run. But right now, everyone's just kind of trying to grab at whatever they can. Like. What, what, what's your actual passion level behind these things? Like, how long do you think something like NBA Top Shot has in terms of longevity? Do you think it's just like a bunch of fucking hype going on right now with anything that looks like a dollar sign can be on it, people are going to reach for? Yeah, and I've been very, very intentional, even to the point where some people were calling me a buzzkill on some of my early streams <laughs> of like, I, I am not selling this as a content creator. And I'm sure you feel this responsibility too of like, with certain aspects with fantasy or whatever of like this, this isn't a get rich quick scheme. This isn't a way to guarantee you are going to make money or guarantee you're going to win your fantasy football league. The reason we're all doing this is because these hobbies or these things have captured our attention and we have fun being a part of the community, making content around them And top shot, just like captivated my attention in a way, like in the same way, a lot of people have said, yeah, I haven't felt this way since I collected sports cards as a kid. I remember collecting the baseball cards, putting them in their sleeves, mm -hmm. going to my buddy's house and trading them. And this created this like virtual world for it. It merged all of these concepts, like you said, with all the stock market stuff, with almost daily fantasy element. You can day trade these, you can hold these long-term investments, like in a way you would in a dynasty football league. Like I want to get DeAndre Swift because I want to just hold that guy forever because I love him. Mm -hmm. Like all the ways that we interact with sports, like Top Shot allows you to interact with it at whichever one of those levels you want. And so it's just been super fun. Like it feels like an arcade for me. Has yeah. my portfolio gone up? Like 100%. <laughs> like not, it's gone up more than 100%, but I'm just saying uh, I have financially benefited from it. But hopefully when I do the streams and stuff and make the videos, I'm, I'm literally doing what I always do. And I'm like, this is fun and I'm having fun. And that's, that's kind of what I've been wrestling with. The, the NFTs are, it, it's such a cool infrastructure around it. Cause most people, when you hear it, I, I'll be honest. Like when I heard the NBA top shot thing, I was like, I had the the very typical reaction to it. Like, this is going to be so dumb. Like why the fuck <laughs> you pay for a clip that you could find on YouTube. And then you ask yourself like, okay, why would you pay X number of dollars for a card? when you could print that out of your printer and it looks exactly the same as a YouTube clip would look to, to NFTs. So, I mean, there's obviously something there. I just, I have the same concern with you that most people get into it for the wrong reasons and they start investing their money. They're not enjoying it. They just saw somebody else do it. They're going to jump in. And uh, that usually ends pretty fucking poorly as it did with, you know, GameStop and, and all those other, uh, all those other things. I, I did want to talk about one more investment. I don't think I put it on the sheet, but I know you are uh, an investor into Underdog, right? Underdog Fantasy? Yeah. So the best ball platform that launched last summer, and they had a lot of big name investors onto it. And I'm assuming this just kind of goes down the pipeline of, of an investment that you made because you believe in the team, you believe in the product. What was like the, I guess, the uh, the process behind like not only your your thinking of why you'd want to invest into it, but like the the logistics behind it too? Like how did you get involved? 
Yeah, I was. I had started doing the randomizer drafts. I was actually doing them uh, on drafters. And Zach over there with drafters, he has a great product too. And we were doing. We just had like a little marketing deal. And then this was right before Underdog had fully launched, and there was all the rumors that it was happening. And my buddy Pete Jennings, um, I think you know, and he's very close uh, with Jeremy. And I think he had said, you know, Pete would be great. He's doing these drafts. I think it'd be great to have them on the Underdog platform. And so he kind of put me in contact with those guys. And we were going to figure out kind of some kind of marketing deal for it. And they also mentioned that there was this opportunity to invest. And so I, I was kind of able to kind of tie those things in together where it made a lot of sense, where it's like, if I'm going to be doing videos about this, it'd be fun to have some of the larger upside if, if the company succeeds. So we were able to last year work out uh, a deal there with um, my investment and getting uh, a marketing deal for doing the randomizer drafts on underdog and it worked out the the platform is perfect for it as it you know coincides with the randomizer drafts and as you know uh, i just think they're super sharp over there and i think it's a great product yeah that was the same way i kind of got involved with them it, it was like completely natural i've been doing videos uh this was back when they were draft i guess obviously two different companies but same kind of premise um that's when i first got involved with them when they were the draft company with the you know the fan duel and everything i had been doing uh, drafts on their stuff, like in my content for probably like a year and a half or two years prior to any sort of partnership deal. And I had posted something on Twitter, like a clip and there was, um, name's David. It was like, they had a marketing over there, commented underneath him. was like, yo, this is dope. And I didn't realize it was him at the time. And I went back to the comment like a few hours later and I clicked on his profile and it was like head of marketing draft. And I was like, yo, like, let's go. So I DM'd him and I was like, yeah, I've been putting these out for like for, for forever right and like you think it's a good video like i'll continue doing these exclusively to you let's work out something and uh, luckily i was living in brooklyn at the time and most of the guys there live in brooklyn so we got to like link up and make this come completely natural and i think that's like the best uh type of partnerships that you can have in this space whether it's investing or whether it's like putting because you know when you when you have a partnership with any sort of like brand or company if they're paying you or whatever like you are putting your time and energy into it that you could be spending elsewhere so like when you're doing that again the content you make needs to be natural. Otherwise you're going to get burned out. But the same thing when it comes to like partnerships, it, it needs to be a completely natural fit to what you're already doing. Yeah. And th this is another thing from say like writing or improv, but you'll hear the phrase show don't tell. Right. And a lot of ads feel like you're telling people why this is good. It's like, no, just show them why it's good. And so that's why I love, you know, when I do the underdog drafts, I, I don't have a promo code. I'm not telling anyone to go play at underdog. They're watching me have fun on underdog mm -hmm. and they're going to want to do that. Or even when I did Roto Grinder sponsored my streams over there, I'm not saying like, go sign up, use this promo code. They're seeing me use their Chrome extension tool that pulls in the ownership present and people are constantly hitting me up. How do I get that ownership extension mm -hmm. tool? Well, you go sign up for RG premium. Like you show people why they would want that thing. You don't tell them. And so not all of those deals exist out there, but like those are the only ones I want to be a part of. Yeah, hundred percent. That's the right way to look at things. I mean, like it's the same way, you know, we, I get reached out to by a lot of like younger kids. They're like, oh, can I help out with the brand or whatever? I'm like, don't, don't, don't ask me what you can do. Don't tell me what you could do. Just do it. You know, like send me a fucking edited video of something that we did. And you're like, this is what I could do for you. Like then my eyes are open. And that's the same way you should be approaching these deals, these partnerships, just your, your content in general. We're going to do something that I have not done before. We are four seasons in, two episodes in. We got some Q&A from the Twitter thoughts. All right. So we are going to run through a few of these. A lot of smart asses out there in the mentions, Nick. Show some fucking respect out here. You first, Ryan Lopes. Uh, this is actually a nice little compliment. I said, yo, I cannot wait for this comma boys period. Like way too, honestly, way too. How are you going to hit a comma and a period and not actually capitalize the first letter, Ryan? I mean, he's a he's a very fancy dude. He's always dressed to the nine, so I, I expect nothing less from Ryan. Yeah, we got we got a lot of love for you, Lopes. All right, let's get some of these actual Q and A's. We got the first one from Justin Freeman at Justin Freeman eighteen. Would be interested to get thoughts on the tipping mechanism that Twitter is floating out there, and the other platforms could also adopt. Would either of you be interested in passing the hat directly to the viewers optionally? You want to take this? Will you uh, first fill me in? I, I saw an article going around, but I didn't read it. What are they floating with the tipping thing? I actually am not really aware of what it is. I'm assuming it's like you set up some sort of like wallet and then you could tweet out and be like, if you guys want to tip me or give money or something, because some people build their their audience on Twitter. So it would make sense, I guess, to, you know, get the, the get the, the money exchange on Twitter if that's where you're giving out value. I think it eliminates a, a step, I guess. I think, I mean, listen, I, there's some shit on Twitter that really like pisses me off and I would never do. And I would actually like advise against it. 
this is not something I, I wouldn't personally ever do this. There's no way I would like ask people on Twitter for money, but I, I don't think it's something I would get necessarily uh, upset about if, if people did it. I think, especially during like this time of the year, a lot of people are diving into like rookie prospects. So you see like a really long thread of like, you know, this player, his production profile, his athleticism, they go through like, they, they take a lot of time to make like clips. If you're really new to the player, like this will be a good breakdown of it. I think throwing like a tweet at the end, that's like, if you want to consider donating, you could do that. I, I don't think that's a terrible idea. I just, I probably wouldn't personally do it. Yeah. I have a couple of thoughts on this real quick though. What are your thoughts on super chats and tips via live YouTube chats? Okay. So yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Cause I guess I already do this through my, this is like Twitter's version of super chats. A lot of the times I'm live streaming and some of the live streams I do are like things I want to really get in like I'll uh, like yesterday I'd hop on to talk about the Carson Wentz trade and people will be in the live stream and I'll see people putting through super chats through. So yeah. I'll be like, yo, stop sending super chats through. I'm not doing Q and a right. Like I appreciate the support, but like, you're not going to get your money's worth if you're throwing money at me because I'm just not answering questions. So yeah. I'm okay with it. If like, I, I really don't like super chats really, but like if it's a Q and a and my intention is to go there and answer questions and like use an hour or two, I'm okay. If they really want a question answered, it's, it's not something that I, that I necessarily love. I know a lot of people do really well with it though. Yeah. I haven't received uh, a ton of super chats myself, but I do. I kind of like the idea. It, it aligns with my sensibilities where I like this idea of it's, it's like there, if you, you want to do it, ask. you don't have to ask. You don't have to ask. <laughs> It was like when I was a kid, my parents are very religious. You know, we always went to church and early on, a lot of the churches you go to, they pass around the tithing thing. And it's like, everyone looking around, you got to give, you got to give. And then we found this church where they just had the boxes in the back. And my parents love that. It was just like, yeah, we're going to still give at the same frequency, but I love that it's not someone putting the basket yeah. in my face. And so I kind of, I kind of like that. And then the other thing I think about a lot lately, and you get this, I'm sure is like, I'm getting way more dms way more ads on twitter way more people hitting me up in dms on discord like what do you think about this top shot moment what do you think about this dfs play all this stuff generally what i've been saying like lately is like go ask me that in the question or the comment of one of my youtube videos because then at least i'm getting some value in tricking the algorithm on some engagement other people might see the response and get value and then it's not just closeted in here where you're kind of monopolizing my time and I'm not getting anything out of it. So then extending that thought process, I'm like, if on Twitter there was like a super chat feature where someone sends you an app with a dollar, like I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to respond That's a cool, versus that, just like pulling my attention away. That's a cool idea. I didn't really think about that. Way. Yeah, the, the way I thought about it was like, you can send out a tweet like, hey, if you want to donate, it's here for you. With super chat for me, it feels more natural because it's like the person is paying you up front. So you're like kind of fulfilling a duty to them. Whereas if you're yeah. on Twitter, like asking for a donation, most people probably won't do it only because like you already gave them the value. So they have no incentive to actually pay you for it. So it's interesting. I think it could work. I think it could be useful for some people. I just, yeah, I don't know if I would, I would personally do it, but I, not a negative towards it. Yeah. I'm, I'm still figuring out my thoughts on it. I would almost think about it in the same way. It's like you tip, you tip the valet or the someone, you know, who, who grabs your luggage for you for just a little, it's like, all right, if I'm going to hit up Nick on Twitter and ask him if he prefers Deandre Swift or JK Dobbins this week, and I'm going to toss him a dollar because I appreciate him, him doing that. I'm pretty sure you would happily answer. And it's like an exchange that makes sense for both parties. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm very much on board for monetizing through like access. I don't necessarily like, yeah. I, I hate the idea of putting content behind a paywall. I don't think I'll ever, Me actually, too. I'll never do that just because, because you and like you and I both know, like we've talked, this entire conversation has been about like how much work we've put into creating content. I don't want to put so much work into content and then have such a limited number of eyeballs get to it, right? Like if you watch, I want the, the most people anywhere to watch it, relate to me, like become part of my audience. And then if you really like me, you'll pay for access to me. That's the way I kind of think about the larger monetary picture. So it's like when people really want access to you, they're also willing to pay uh, a lot more, which is why I think like from a comedy standpoint, like the physical connection is so much greater than just like a, a blog post or like an informational value post. People will pay for access to you. Yeah, I've started messing around. I've been doing a thing in my Discord and I haven't even done it in the private chat yet, but I've just did a thing where I'm like, all right, I'll hop in the voice channel and I'm going to go over to the Top Shot Discord, which is this toxic hellscape. And I'm just going to read comments in here in rows. And so a bunch of people pile in the voice channel and it's literally just me talking myself. It basically is doing a stand-up <laughs> set. And I did that for like 25 minutes last night and, and people seem to seem to love it. And so I feel like there is kind of stuff like that that I should be leaning into. 
There is, man. It, it, it's it, it's tough once you start doing stuff like that and then trying to flip it reverse and then like, now I'm going to put a paywall behind it. But yeah. when you are thinking of like a new product or service from the rip, understand that paying for access to you without like making something where the more people that have access to it, the more work it's going to be for you. You either make it something that's scalable without having to put more work into it or, you know, supply demand. You raise the prices if the access demand is, is like really high for it. All right. Yeah. Thank you question, Justin. Let's move to the second one from Kazen. I, lo- I don't know how to say that. How to balance a full-time job that is outside fantasy football and creating a mass amount of fantasy content, even during normal work hours. How do you get your employer to buy into more uh, of a flexible schedule? So I feel like at some point or another, we kind of worked around this throughout the uh, the conversation. One, it's just like a fuckload of work. There's no like shortcut to it. It's like you have to put, the- you- I- I've said this before, like if you want to be full-time in this industry, you got to work full-time before you are actually full-time. You could probably speak to this a little bit more because you you have someone kind of depending on t- uh, on you as a, you know, a wife. And I'm sure it's not much different than like a bunch of annoying friends. No, dis- no disrespect <laughs> to your wife, but like you, you probably have a lot more going on right now with your nine to five with your wife um, while doing all this stuff. So maybe it's the creative zone. Maybe it's like really sacrificing other things, but what would you attribute it to? Well, I was laughing at the end of that question where it was like, how would you get your employer on board with a more flexible work schedule? And, uh, one great way is a global pandemic is a r- <laughs> great way to get them on board with a flexible work schedule, because that's, that's what mine was to be fair though. My company always had a pretty relaxed policy. Even my boss works remotely before the pandemic, a couple of days from home because she had a long commute and, you know, they had given us, we were working Fridays remotely, even pre pandemic. So we're kind of naturally segued into that, but they, they just trust you to get your work done. I know the stuff I have to do. I get it done. And I've, I've appreciated the flexibility of like before I would do it between nine to five, like most people. And now if I have something I'm needing to do in the morning for one of my fantasy things, yeah, maybe I'm doing some of my day job work at seven at night, but that's fine because I've made that choice and I can kind of prioritize things how I want. And, you know, for doing all the stuff we do with video and audio, I couldn't do that in the office. And let me me ask you, so say the uh, pandemic comes to an end everybody's fucking vaccinated within the next month you have to go back into your office maybe they normally don't do the whole in the office thing but say you did i'm assuming you're in a a place right now where you want to continue this momentum of content creation for like a large majority of your day like you don't want to let this momentum kind of slip by you what kind of conversation would you have with your boss then if like you know would you kind of like lie about it and be like i just want more flexibility given you know the happiness level i had working from home or would you would you tell them straight up like how would you actually approach that conversation yeah i don't the again we, we've already started doing some like surveys with our company and it seems like a lot of people are pro continuing to work from home so again i think i'm in a really fortunate spot but like just for that thought experiment i think i would be very honest and be like i'm happy to continue working and I can do most of this remote. I'll come in for big meetings. Like fortunately I live like 10 minutes from my office. So it's an easy commute. And I said, you know, I'll come in for these things, important stuff, but you know, I really want to continue working remotely, maybe almost as like a glorified contractor, I think would be probably the conversation I have to your point of not wanting to give this up, this flexibility, this momentum that I built and allowed me to, to do all the things I want to do. Yeah, I think you need to have a very like honest conversation with whoever it is you're working for. But again, like put your put your like happiness first. I'm not telling you like leave your job or some shit, but that's kind of what I did. If you believe in what you're doing or just figure out a way to, you know, if, if your job won't let you chase after the things that do make you happy there, are, you know, obviously maybe not in this economy, but you could figure something out that probably pays the bills that allows you the time and flexibility to do the things you enjoy if that's you know, your main priority. You obviously have to prioritize whatever it is in your life to do it. But again, it goes back to to working hard. This is obviously, if there's ever a time to be able to create from home, this is it. It's going to be interesting to see how this kind of swings in the in the pendulum of, of the work from home thing. Because I think for a long time, it was so like everybody needs to be in the office. People, you know, you would never be able to work from home unless there was like seven feet of snow outside. And I yeah. loved working from home, dude. Like that was my, those were some of my favorite days because I always felt like, I'd be most creative when I wanted to and you get to wake up whenever the fuck you wanted to. And now it's got to the point where like everybody's working from home. But I think a lot of people, especially like in New York, where it's winter now and it gets dark at 4 p.m. And people are like, oh, I love working from home during the summer. This shit hits. It gets depressing. You're like, damn, I kind of wish I was back at the office, had the camaraderie. So I think we're going to see for the next year 
companies are going to be like, oh, it saved us a lot of money. We don't have to pay for rent. We don't have to get an office lease. So they're going to yeah. go like too far to the other end of the spectrum. And eventually within a year, we'll probably settle back into the medium of where it probably should have been all along. It is. It's a dynamic I think about a lot because I we we socialize online. Like I don't feel like, yes, there are obviously things I miss desperately, mainly travel, but like I don't feel like I've taken a hit socializing. I socialize with my friends <laughs> online like three to four nights a week. I, I like I legitimately have a blast. But I know for some people who don't have a robust online social life, like, yeah, I want to be in the office at the in the kitchenette, you know, talking with people in between, you know, working on stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's a it's a weird time, but like there if there's ever time to figure out flexibility, like now, now is the time to really sit down and, and think about how you would approach that. All right. Last question from my man, Scott Simpson, one of my favorite people on, yeah. on the Twitter sphere. So the best way to meet slash introduce yourself to advertisers. I think this question is extremely helpful to a lot of people that really have no fucking idea how this works. Yeah, Go you're ahead. you're going to be have way more to say about this than me, because my strategy has been. And this is this is probably bad, but I have literally never approached anyone. I've never asked. And one, there's probably some laziness to that and some opportunities I've left on the table. On the other hand, it's nice to always have leverage when people reach out to you. And so I've I've kind of appreciated the leverage standpoint, but am I doing it wrong? Not, you know, pounding the pavement more, trying to reach out to other people? Yes, probably at your size. I think most people when they're I think I, I don't want to put like numbers behind everything just to make it relative. Like I want to say, Scott, maybe 5,000 Twitter followers or so. You're not going to get a lot of notice from brands and companies unless you're like really making an impact in the community or some of your content starts to go viral. So for a long time, I was the same way. I was like, I'm not, you know, like who, who am I to reach out to a company? If they think it's a natural fit, it'll naturally happen and they'll find yeah. me and, you know, we'll work together. What I've realized is like, I'm fucking passionate about certain products and certain services. And I'm like, okay pitching that to my audience. <laughs> so I've gotten to the point where, and I was just kind of kind of riff off this question, but I actually did pull up. So uh, are you familiar with the company Felix Gray? No. So they make these glasses, uh, the blue light mm -hmm. glasses. And I would say that they're probably like more on like the luxury side-esque. I think a lot, of, a lot of the companies are like cheaper ones on Amazon for like 10, 20 bucks or whatever. They have like the bright orange lenses and shit. And I found this company a couple of years ago. And th this is when I first started doing all this YouTube stuff. And I was working, you know, relentlessly, like so many fucking hours in a day. By the end of the day, my eyes were like bleeding out of my fucking head. And I was like, I can't, you know, I don't know what, the, I don't know what's happening right now. Right. Luckily technology has advanced and we know that there's like blue light coming out. So I bought these glasses and they've like <laughs> legitimately saved my life. And like, I can testify to that. And this is why I feel absolutely no shame plugging glasses like this. Cause they've legitimately been su such a help for me. So for a company like Felix Gray, I reached out to them. Like I went to their website. I found their marketing email. I think if you find something you're passionate about, you can do research on like who is in the marketing department. If you're going after like a bigger brand or company, your shit's probably going to kind of just get lost in the wayside. So I would look for something that's more niche, more passionate, and so that you could actually have more passion towards when you do reach out to them and find out the marketing email, find out some of the people that work in the marketing department and email them. And I actually pulled up the email that I sent to Felix Gray. So I'm just going to fucking read it off and let it rip. So people do can it. get like, a, a relative idea. So I reached out and said, Hey guys, uh, I want to reach, reach out in regards to interest you might have in part, uh, partnering up with content creators. I absolutely love your glasses. I've been using them for like almost two years now. I purchased anywhere between like three and five of the pairs and I can't say enough good about them. Anyways, I have my own uh, brand mainly centered uh, on our YouTube channel with X number of subscribers. And then I linked the YouTube channel. The content itself is primarily focused on fantasy football, but I do a lot of like lifestyle and vlogging stuff as well. The video I put out today with the link, ironically, wasn't wearing your glasses uh, in them for the first time in a while, but I mentioned them and I threw a link in the description. And on the back end, I'm seeing, you know, 70 or 80 click throughs on it. Uh, mm -hmm. I have no idea what the conversion rate is for you guys. Maybe you can tell me. Here's the link. Uh, I don't want to get caught in the numbers too much, but if you want to check out the video, the, the the read about your guys starts from like the 113 mark on when I mentioned Felix Gray, which led to the clicks. Uh, I think it'd be a great fit for your brand, given how much I actually love the product. Just wanted to inquire about any interest in possibly working together in the future. That was all the way back in June. So that was like eight months ago at this point. Hmm. They got back to me like three days later from their size. Hey, Nick, thank you so much for reaching out to Felix Gray. So glad to hear you're such a fan. I absolutely love the shout out you did in your videos earlier this week. Uh, I'll be sure to keep an eye on to see if any of the conversions come through, whatever. Uh, I'd love to chat uh, about ways we can work together. I'd be happy to send you another pair of glasses in exchange for additional shout outs, whatever. And then we got the kind of conversation flowing through them. 
But I will caveat by saying the first video I've done with them as a sponsored video was literally, I think, three days ago. So that email was in June. What you have to understand is the bigger the company you reach out to, the longer the time frame of is of something happening to because they have a lot of loopholes they got to go through with their marketing budget and they plan this stuff out very well in advance. But I think the bigger picture is here, like when you're reaching out to these companies, it always has to be what you're doing for them, why you love their product and service, why it's a good fit and why you're a good fit to represent them. So it's like your brand, your personality, why you love the product, and then maybe they'll notice it, but make it as easy as humanly possible for them to get to the point. That's why, you know, you link your YouTube channel, you link your socials, you link exactly what you were talking about when you were talking about their product. So they don't, if it's the minute they got to do extra legwork, the minute that deal is done. You know what I mean? How do you think about it from the perspective of this, they're like, all right, this guy's reaching out. If they kind of say no, or we just don't have this in our budget, or there's nothing we can do for you. Are you kind of like spiteful? Like, all right, I'm not wearing these glasses. I'm not talking about this. Like that concept of leverage. And from their point of view, if they're like, why would we uh, buy the cow if we can just get the milk for free? And Nick's going to talk about them and we don't have to give him anything. Yeah, How do you I mean, think about that? It's a good point. And like, it, you you can't control that shit. Like if, if someone says no to me, like here's the thing, I'll, I'll only reach out to companies in which I love, I absolutely love the fucking product and I believe in it. So like, regardless of their answer, I'm still wearing these glasses because my eyes yeah. would suffer if I didn't. You know what I mean? Like that's the yeah. kind of shit you gotta be thinking about. Like don't reach out to half-ass companies because that passion will come through. And and this this email, like I think originally when I sent them, like they didn't, they, they wanted to work together, but they didn't have anything in the plan marketing budget wise. And then I saw some other like content creators on Twitter or on YouTube or whatever, getting paid by Felix Gray to do sponsored posts throughout their video. And this was like five or six months later. And that's when I reached back out. I was like, oh, they must have like some kind of like influencer budget now. Let me, yeah. uh, let me hit them back and see if we can kind of circle back and, and, and figure things out. So I, I would say like, listen, I've, I've reached out to tons of companies for products that I believe in and haven't been answered to, have been told they don't have the budget. I've just been told it's not the right fit. We're not in your industry. I'm just like, I, I disagree with everything they fucking say, but like, yeah. you know, what are you gonna do? Like if that's just, it's just the spontaneity of, of life really. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah, I think that's good to know. And uh, it's giving me the, the the confidence to take a few shots, being willing, in the same way I was telling people you need to be able to stomach rejection with your content flopping, I should probably be able to stomach rejection of getting turned away because if I'm never getting turned away, it probably means I'm not trying hard enough. Yeah, I think just like write a list down of three to five potential sponsors that you're really, really into that you would be giving them value if you worked with them and, and tell them how you'd be giving them value or why, why, your, uh, why your brand is so loyal to you, why your audience is so loyal to you. Send them a piece of your funniest fucking content. A guy, you got to realize like when you're doing these business deals, they're not even like business related. They're human to human. If so, like yeah. Pete, if you reached out, sent like your funniest clip of like two minutes, 30 seconds and the guy in the marketing department watched it, he'd be like, holy shit. Like I want to work with this guy. He's funny. He could be like a good representative of our brand and more people need to think like that. So, so find three or five sponsors that you like figuring out, figure out who you need to get in contact with the more specific you can probably the better in the marketing department. And then, then shoot off like a very personal, real email to them. And I, I bet they'll get back to you within a week or so. You hear that XFL? <laughs> Hit me up. I know we're launching here in about another year. I'm ready to be the face of the XFL. XFL is another great fucking example. So one video <laughs> me and my friends did where we, we went to an XFL game. We did the whole tailgate thing and we went to a game and we vlogged the whole day and came out to like a fantastic piece of fucking content. The tailgate was a fucking electric. The game was awesome. And I tried so hard to get in touch with people at the XFL, like even on this, some of the people on, on like Twitter has their DMs open. He's got like 400 followers. I was like, there's no way he's not going to see this. And I laid it out. I was like, we did this. Like, I would love to get some kind of like media pass where we yeah. can go around the tailgate, interview people, get into the, the locker rooms, even if you want to do some crazy shit and let us in there and just nothing, just like birds. I'm like, this is fucking terrible on your part because I believe in what we could do for you guys. But that's just like the way that shit goes. For sure. And by the way, if when Corona's ever over, if you ever want to do like a tailgate bit and you got like your camera crew, I'd love to come up there and, and cause some ruckus uh, with some man on the street stuff would be fun. Dude, it'd be fucking fantastic. You come up to New York, we'll go to tailgate, we'll go around, walk around Times Square and just do a bunch of hood rat shit. I'd be so down. That'd be, that'd be love lovely. it. All right. That's really all I got. I think I, I think that was the Q&A's. That was the question. I told you, man, this would this would go look at an hour and 45 and you were worried about following up on Andy, man. Come on. <laughs> no, this was this was honestly good. You got my wheels turning. I feel like I feel like I'm getting the benefit of being the viewer on this despite being on the show. So no, this has been great. 
Well, it's, it's been fun for me too. I'm, I'm hoping it's been fun for the audience as well. I'm sure it has. Make sure you're following Pete. I will link his YouTube, everything he's doing. Make sure you're following him on Twitter right below in the description as well as the top pin thing in the comment section. Peter, thank you for spending your lovely Friday afternoon with us and uh, we'll see you next week.